gravitational waves. Like a ripple, they travel through the fabric of the cosmos, warping space-time and setting all matter they encounter in elastic natural vibration. Though of course so imperceptibly that until recently it was impossible to measure them. On September the 14th, 2015, physicists were able to directly observe gravitational waves for the first time, almost exactly 100 years after Albert Einstein had first postulated their existence. The classical Newtonian idea of gravity held that objects mutually attract each other spatially and without any impact on time, with a force proportional to their mass and inversely proportional to the square of their mutual distance. Einstein hypothesized that gravity arises because mass curves time and space. He supposed that matter distorts the structure of space-time, as would a ball resting on a sheet made of soft rubber. The greater the mass, the more pronounced the curvature. This theory was experimentally proven in 1919. Einstein won the Nobel Prize in 1921 for his contributions to theoretical physics. Astronomers are the ones who actually vindicated Einstein's theory of gravity. How? Well, by looking at eclipses, and this is the real data from 1919. It's terrible, it's out of focus, but it was good enough to show that stars next to the sun were displaced due to the gravity of the sun and the way that the sun curved space. Because Einstein, to solve this seemingly small problem, had to say that space was curved by mass. That was a huge leap forward. Many people were, of course, skeptical. Others weren't. But it's been vindicated, and that basic idea has never been shown to be false. According to Einstein's theory, masses don't just curve space-time, they also distort it in periodic rhythms when undergoing acceleration or deceleration. These movements generate waves, ripples in the fabric of space-time, that propagate outward at the speed of light. An observation station with precise enough tools of measurement could ascertain a passing gravitational wave's effect on space-time. Distances between objects will increase and decrease rhythmically as the wave passes, according to the frequency of the wave. The magnitude of this effect decreases in inverse proportion to the distance from the source. A spinning disk or a sphere wouldn't generate gravitational radiation, while a planet orbiting around a star would. However, these waves are only significant enough to detect when generated by very dense and massive systems, such as binary systems of black holes, neutron stars, pulsars or white dwarf stars, supernovae, aspherical or asymmetrical neutron stars, and remnants of gravitational radiation created by the birth of the universe. Gravitational waves transport energy, as Richard Feynman showed in 1957 in a thought experiment known as the sticky bead argument. Feynman imagined a sticky bead moving freely on a rod perpendicular to the source of an approaching gravitational wave. As the wave passes the rod, it sets its matter in rhythmic motion, which is passed on to the bead. The bead in turn moves back and forth along the rod. Since there's friction between the bead and the rod, heat is generated by this movement. And since the movement was initiated by the gravitational wave, the wave must have carried energy. In 1965, Feynman was awarded a Nobel Prize for his work in quantum electrodynamics. The first indirect proof of gravitational waves was accomplished by astronomers Russell A. Hulse and Joseph H. Taylor, Jr. through the observation of a binary pulsar system they discovered in 1974. A pulsar is a dense star with more mass than our Sun, but a radius of only about 10 kilometers. In a binary pulsar, two such stars orbit each other at a relatively close distance. Hulse and Taylor observed the system for four years and found that the stars orbited each other in an ever tighter, ever faster orbit. The cause for this was clear. Energy was being lost, radiating out in the form of gravitational waves as predicted by Einstein. In 1993, this discovery earned Hulse and Taylor a Nobel Prize, but the direct proof of gravitational waves was still to come. Gravity waves probably have not been detected yet. Perhaps they have, but not everybody thinks so. But uh, many people are working on much more sensitive detectors, and uh, probably someday gravity waves will be detected. However, uh, the, uh, exceeding the limitations imposed by quantum mechanics in such measurements is uh, the subject of the 
to topic uh, is the subject of the uh, discipline called quantum non-demolition measurements. This work represents part of a major program at Caltech to build the most sensitive detector possible for gravity waves. Uh, estimates based on an intuitive application of the uncertainty principle to the experimental configuration uh, set a quantum limit on the smallest signal which could be received. Furthermore, in order to conduct the procedures that quantum mechanics requires, they would have to have an ensemble of gravity wave detectors, and they would be well off if they had an ensemble of gravity waves falling on the system. And a gravity wave is something that you take when you get it, and uh, you, you can't be sure the next one will be the same kind of wave. The detector Dr. Lamb is referring to is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO, founded in 1992, ten years after his Lindau lecture. It began operating in 2002. In September 2015, following a major upgrade with new high-performance sensors, LIGO was brought back online and almost immediately observed the first confirmed gravitational waves. The waves had been released during the collapse of two black holes 1.3 billion light-years away. In the LIGO interferometer, a laser beam is split in two, and each beam passes along two perpendicular four-kilometer long tunnels. At the end of each tunnel, the beams are reflected and sent back to their source, where they should rejoin each other at the same instant and cancel each other out. However, if a gravitational wave passes through, causing a tiny distortion in the length of one tunnel, the two beams will travel a slightly different distance and no longer arrive back at the same time. The resulting anomaly manifests as an audible chirp. While the interferometers are similar to the ones Michelson developed in the 1880s, they use extremely advanced adaptations, special mirrors that work like traps to reflect the light along each four-kilometer arm hundreds of times, before allowing it to merge with a transverse beam for observation. This means the light travels through each arm a distance of 1120 kilometers before its interference with the perpendicular beam is measured. This distance is 144,000 times the length of Michelson's original detectors. The distortion observed in 2015 was 10,000 times smaller than the diameter of a proton. The proof of gravitational waves doesn't just confirm the accuracy of Einstein's theory of general relativity, it also opens to researchers a new window into the cosmos. Until now, only electromagnetic waves and neutrinos could reveal information on events present or past in the universe. Even light itself only first originated 380,000 years after the Big Bang. As to what existed before then, perhaps now gravitational wave telescopes will be able to tell us. What is going to be done after this? We are now hot on the trail of measuring the, the effects of the primordial gravitational waves, if they exist. The uh, hypothesis is this primordial material of the inflationary period, with its quantum mechanical fluctuations, had uh, kind of equal partition between many different kinds of um, variations and oscillations, including gravitational waves. There should have been some. So here is a concept from Goddard Space Flight Center, where I work, um, that shows a, uh, a sort of uh, improved version of the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, but with polarimeters inside to, to make a map. So it is possible that in another decade or so, maybe even less, you will hear about the uh, demonstration that either the Big Bang material had gravitational waves in it or not, and this will tell us about the, uh, the scalar fields or inflationary fields that may have existed that propelled the original expansion. So it's, this is nature's uh, particle accelerator for us. It's uh, capable, capable of reaching much higher energies than we can ever imagine uh, producing here on the ground. In the future, observing gravitational waves could help us investigate causes of black holes, supernovae and neutron stars. Gravitational waves may also make it possible for us to break new ground in the field of quantum gravitation. And they might even help us better understand the origin and expansion of our universe. <laughs>